Uh, in today's lecture, I will talk about disease, insects, and weeds. No matter what you are trying to control, you have to think of a comprehensive approach. Uh, organic, uh, for me, does not mean uh, you absolutely use no pesticides at all. I mean uh, a wholesome approach to organic gardening. Now, my definition of organic gardening is uh, using pesticides uh, that are approved by uh, USDA or uh, Texas uh, uh, Department of Agriculture as organic, not rely on one product or one tool, whether it's uh, hoeing for weeds or whether it's uh, seven for insecticides or whether it's BT for uh, insects, or, you know, uh, one approach does not work. Uh, it does not work for commercial growers. It does not work for organic growers. Uh, so, so let's talk uh, about uh, before you plant practices uh, for disease control. Before you plant practices is something we most uh, forget. Uh, we just uh, till the soil and uh, dig a hole, or maybe not even till the soil, dig a hole and put the plant and we're done. But really, uh, uh, you're forgetting probably 50% of the work. You have to, um, immediately after you harvest your last crop, you should destroy and bury uh, or re remove and trash, throw in the trash uh, all your plants. Uh, remove the stakes, remove the uh, any support structures, uh, clean them, um, use disease-free seeds and transplants. Uh, sanitation is very, very important, very important. Uh, if you go to your tool shed and if your hoe is dirty and got mud and it's not clean and sharp, then your sanitation is poor. If your stakes are just sitting uh, on the ground, uh, um, you know, um, or sitting on the edge of the garden, uh, and then you reuse them again, you are pr they probably have some spores of some disease or insect egg that you're going to bring it back into the garden. Uh, believe me, what you don't see is what you should worry about, not uh, the white fly that you start seeing and you say, oops, I got a problem. What you don't see uh, is, uh, is more important. Controlling weed is, is very important in sanitation because, as you all know, weeds are a host to many insects and many diseases. So if you spray, don't just spray uh, the, uh, the plant itself, but spray on the ground if you're spraying insecticide or fungicide. Spray on the ground below the plant. Spray if there are any weeds, uh, even three, four feet uh, uh, around the raised bed uh, because the, the, uh, the bug will fly and jump out, uh, escape to the lawn or the weeds uh, on the edge of your garden, and then wait a few days and come back. Now, the cultural uh, decisions you have to make before you plant is the number one is choose a good site. Um, OK, you cannot uh, uh, select a bad site. It doesn't rain well, uh, a low air pocket, uh, shade, heavy shade all day long, and then think that it can improve with time. If your soil drainage is poor, unless you go to extreme measure like doing, uh, uh, like doing a French drain, uh, that soil cannot be improved. Get a soil test. Get a soil test. I'm probably going to hear me say that um, uh, often today. Get a soil test to determine your fertility needs uh, in advance. And before you plant, that soil should be, if you get a soil test, all the bars uh, on that soil test should be minimum at the clear level. Then you'll know you've done a good job, and the plants are at a great start. And there are some soil tests that will count uh, if you have any nematodes. Uh, 
in the soil and um, um, this way you know I'm gonna spray something I'm gonna solarize I'm gonna do something and then not plant this spring if you think uh, for example your yield last year or you, you as you're cleaning up the garden at the end of the season you see nematodes uh, on, the, on your tomato roots then there are soil tests to tell you how bad it is uh, and uh, how much you want to spray Rotation, uh, crop rotation is important. I'll show you some slides. Uh, here is uh, some details about site selection. If you see here in this picture, uh, the tree, uh, uh, the even though the roots usually uh, are um, under the drip line, but the effect of the, those roots, the smaller roots that you don't see, sometimes it's twice the width of that tree and the shade uh, and of course uh, the shade is twice and equal to the height of that tree there too. So um, uh, trees in the, if you have trees that shade your garden in the morning, that is, then that is definitely not a good garden site. Uh, in Texas we have plenty of sun, we have too much sun I think. Uh, I tell everybody that if your garden is fully shaded starting at 2, 3 in the afternoon, then uh, you're done as long as it's uh, in full sun in the morning. By then, by the afternoon, the plants are respiring as fast as they are making food. So if they are in the shade, uh, you're uh, relieving some of the stress. So uh, don't worry if your garden is fully shaded starting at 2 or 3 in the afternoon. And I'll show you pictures about uh, soil drainage, how you can improve a very poor garden. Look at this picture here. This picture is taken in Beaumont. As you know, Beaumont is famous for rice production. So can you grow a garden here? No. If you put a raised bed right there, uh, that raised bed will absorb all that water and become a sponge cake. So also you cannot grow. But that gentleman, that master gardener there uh, installed French drain to drain his garden and with time he's able to do a garden like this. Okay, uh, get a soil test. Um, I re recommend a soil test um, initially for a beginner once every year uh, so that you know uh, how is uh, your garden responding to your uh, soil test, uh, to your fertilizer application. Uh, in the first two or three years you can follow the phosphorus uh, trend and see if it's not slowly going up. If it is, then you say I'm not adding anything with phosphor in it at all. With time, as you learn and you become experienced after the first three, four years, then you can skip to every uh, to every third year, if you like. Uh, for ten dollar a soil test, it's a wonderful in, uh, investment because remember, it is better to put a dollar plant in a ten dollar hole than a ten dollar plant in a dollar hole. And the way to get to that $10 hole is to, the first step is to get a soil test, improve it, fix it, add everything you need to it. Then whatever plant you put in it is going to grow and yield. Okay? I told you about crop rotation in general. When you do a crop rotation, whether you have a 100 acre field or a now this is general recommendation. Trust me, uh, I uh, you find that sometimes they are very low and not appropriate, uh, especially if you want to plant tomatoes. That's why you get a soil test and you tell them I'm planting tomato, and they will give you uh, and other vegetable. They give you two results from your soil same test: one for tomatoes and one for vegetables. Uh, that will get you uh, a, uh, exactly the amount that you need per, unfortunately the soil test for homeowner is per thousand square feet. So you'll have to do the math to divide it down to uh, 40 square feet if you have 4 by 10 raised bed. But uh, the, that's the way to, to go. Okay, uh, so even if you have 4 raised beds, you can rotate between these four raised beds as long as you keep in mind that I'm switching between families of crops, not between names of crops. For example, if you, if you uh, plant uh, year after year, you, if you follow kale by cauliflower or cauliflower followed by cabbage, broccoli or any of these, you did not rotate because they're all in the same family. 
radish is in the same family as cabbage. You know, a lot of people don't know that. But potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, pepper are in the same family. So you don't want to plant tomatoes in the spring and then pepper in the fall. That is not a rotation. Uh, all the uh, chives, garlic, leek, onion are same family, etc. All the vining crops, cucumber, melon, pumpkin, squash, zucchini, gourd, uh, winter squash are all in the same family. So always keep that in mind. Uh, lettuce and artichoke, that's new to me. Uh, um, uh, those are in the same family. So uh, always room to learn, even for me. I had no idea. Uh, I guess I forgot. Artichoke is, well, when you think about the flower of both, uh, yes, I can see that they are both in the composite family, and they should be. Okay, let's move on. So here's an example of what I call a good rotation and a bad rotation. A uh, good rotation in the spring, you plant tomato on that bed. Uh, in that same spot, you follow in the spring by spinach. Well, this is two different families. The following year, bean and mustard on that same spot. All these four are different families. Uh, cantaloupe, onion, all of them are different families. So year four, when you start the cycle again with tomato, between tomato and tomato, uh, you had uh, uh, two and a half years and five crops. So on that spot, what's the chances of nematodes getting uh, uh, in increasing in numbers on the tomatoes? Very slim. Whereas in this bad rotation, you grow tomato in the spring followed by potato in the fall. Well, you gave the nematode food for a whole year instead of just six months. Uh, and uh, you wonder why uh, for the fourth year you have more uh, nematodes. Bean and peas are the same family, so that's not a good rotation. Cantaloupe, pumpkin, that's not a good rotation. So between tomato and tomato, instead of two and a half years, now you have two years and two crops instead of five crops in a good rotation. So keep that in mind. Now let me be specific when I say rotation. It does not have to be a mile away to be considered a rotation, okay? Because we are not trying to fool uh, the insects. The insect will fly and find you if it's here or if you move the plant a mile away. We're not trying to fool airborne diseases because they're airborne. They will go with the wind and find you no matter where you are. We are trying to, in a rotation, we are trying to reduce the incidence of nematodes and soil-borne diseases. And when you remember that an inch for a nematode is like a mile away, even if you move tomato from one end of the bed to the other end of the bed, five feet away, that's like a uh, eternity for the nematode. So it does not have to be a rotation from one bed totally to another bed. It could be five feet away and uh, can reduce your nematode chances or soil-borne diseases. So keep that in mind. In this slide, I'm uh, not going to go into too much detail. I'll just tell you what it is. This is what I call a four-bed rotation with uh, lots of some winter and summer cover crops. Even in a raised bed, a good gardener should always have a crop, cover crop, crop, cover crop, crop, cover crop. Ideally, your garden should not just sit idle uh, and doing nothing uh, for, to let weeds uh, multiply. Because uh, this cover crop here is adding food for your plant. I bet you when you cut this winter pea and let it rot for a couple of weeks uh, before you plant your potatoes, you do not have to. You do not have to add uh, any pre-plant fertilizer for that potatoes. Potatoes followed by snap beans, followed by buckwheat. From this date to this date, you cut it at this date. You, this is a summer cover crop. You're only growing it to keep the weeds down, to add more uh, organic food back to the soil. Basically, you cut it and you throw it on the ground. Uh, not even have to till it in, you follow with garlic. Garlic, let's say from mid-August, you harvested the following year, and then, so that's what this date mean here. Garlic from 8.15 to 5.15. Unfortunately, you miss the window to plant in the spring, then you go for a cover crop, uh, and then uh, another cover crop, and then basically you're waiting for the fall garden. 
but in the fall garden, nine, the cabbage, 915, for example, to March the 5th, you follow it with tomato. You can solarize or add wheat uh, from this date to this date. Then you can follow in, uh, uh, with another uh, cold crop or greens. Now, I just told you, I just told you uh, don't follow cabbage with another cold crop, but you follow cabbage on that bed with tomato, you solarize or you add wheat grain, that, uh, this crop is uh, a million mile away from the same crop here, so you're safe that way. So read this, and if you have any question, uh, adapt it, adopt it, and uh, let me know. Laura types different soil test recommendation. Okay, how do the uh, soil recommendation differ between tomatoes uh, the, uh, and the uh, general vegetables? Uh, when you send a soil test, tell them I'm growing tomatoes and I'm growing vegetables. They send you back two uh, papers, one, for, one recommendation for tomato and one recommendation for general vegetables. Why two? Because tomato is a heavy feeder. Uh, let's uh, divide vegetables into th three groups, light feeders, the general population, let's say in the middle, and the heavy feeders. Heavy feeders mean they need a lot of fertilizer uh, to produce. Organic, inorganic, the plant does not care, I don't care, whatever you want to use, that, uh, uh, as but they need a lot of fertilizer. And examples of heavy feeders are tomato, potato, onion, and sweet corn. If you're planting those, you're generally applying twice the amount of fertilizer as the uh, most vegetables, what I call, in the, in, the, in the middle, the general population. The light feeders are those crops that uh, are in the bean family because they fix their own nitrogen. Okay, so you do not want to put the same amount of fertilizer as if you put tomato and beans right next to each other and you fertilize them the same way, you are hurting the bean. It will grow to be six foot tall and not a single pod on it. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's why you get so, two soil test recommendations because tomato, corn, sweet corn, onion, and potato are heavy feeders, and, and you'll see that the results are a little bit higher in the amount of recommendation. Back to before you plant, you'll notice that a lot of the work we're doing is before we plant. Uh, on, honestly, it's 50% of the challenge for a good garden is before you plant practices. You can use mulch. Mulch is very important. Mulch over time, you can type it, uh, uh, it will comp uh, break down and then you can mix it in the ground and it becomes compost. Consider staking, caging, trellising so that you lift those plants above the ground, why run uh, cucumbers on the ground and waste all that space, uh, put it, at, uh, grow it on a trellis like you're growing uh, beans, for example, and lift it above the ground, this way the tomato, uh, the peppers, sorry, the cucumbers are not going to touch the ground and potentially rot. Uh, I've, I've heard of this, I've never tried it, but it's a good organic practice. Uh, some people put... Uh, 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 sir, uh, aluminum foil on the bottom of the stems if they've had an issue with southern blight in, in the past. Uh, they say it works. Uh, it can work, but it's not uh, absolutely uh, effective, but it, but it can reduce. And try solarization. I'll show you a picture of solarization. Remember these, rem you know NPK in a fertilizer. Okay, remember uh, this, N uh, is if you're growing a leaf crop, so N stands for leaves, P if you're growing a root crop, you need a little bit extra phosphorus if you're growing a root crop, and K if you're growing a fruit crop uh, and fruit quality. So NPK, uh, I memorize it as leaves, uh, roots, fruits, or fruit quality. Okay, so if you add too much nitrogen on a fruit crop like tomato, you're going to have lots of, lot of leaves, but very few tomatoes. Uh, here's an example of mulching. Um, 
I mean, whether it's an experiment trial like I'm doing here, or uh, but you add all this mulch, you are not going to have any weeds. And this mulch a year later broke down and basically disappeared uh, because of all the uh, sprinkler irrigation. So we spread it over the soil here and rototilled it in, and that was free compost. Um, here is a, another type of mulching using rice hulls, free rice hulls, and he's using it as mulch here. Here's an ex look at the benefit of plastic mulch. This is, of course, from a commercial operation, but look at this tomato, uh, watermelon. No weeds around it. The weeds are only on the edge where they're getting a lot of water from under the plastic. Uh, you can mulch with pecan shells, even though some people say it can be acidic or this, but it breaks down so slow that uh, it's not going to affect uh, your uh, soil uh, issues at all. Uh, Leo Lombardini in our department here, uh, uh, because he works with pecans, he has excess amount of pecan shells, he, he loves it, he uses it uh, all the time uh, as a uh, mulch. This is solarization. The solarization is a wonderful tool. I don't see why uh, we don't use it. It is perfectly suited for Texas because uh, for most gardens, uh, for most locations, our tomatoes quit producing in July. So many gardeners uh, remove the tomatoes in July and then replant again in mid-August uh, for a fall crop. Well, that, that window, what I call resting window, if you're not growing a cover crop, here's another option that you can do. If you're not growing a summer cover crop like buckwheat or lab lab bean, which adds more nitrogen back in the soil, if you think you're starting to have issues with weeds, nematodes, soil diseases, solarization is an alternative for your lab lab bean summer cover crop. And to be successful here, you see a solarization on a raised bed. To be successful, you need three things. Uh, the soil should be saturated with water, so add all the water you can. Uh, then use clear plastic, even though this picture doesn't show it. Uh, it looks white, but this is really clear plastic. And you tuck in the edges to make a tight seal. And if you do that for four to six weeks, you'll uh, the temperature under that plastic will reach 170 every day, and that can kill everything that there. It does not control. Uh, perennial weeds, like nut sedge, it does not control the rhizomes, uh, but it will kill all the annual seeds uh, of weeds. It will control lots of uh, insect eggs. It will reduce your nematodes. It does, n it does work. And uh, th it also works in the fall. This here is a small trial I'm doing. And this is 83, uh, 83 days after uh, I, uh, solar, at the end of the solarization treatment on 11.5, so take out almost three months. So this was done in mid-August. Okay, I thought, does solarization work in the fall, uh, even with cooler temperature? Look at this 10 by 10 uh, uh, area that was solarized uh, 83 days later compared to the plot that was not solarized, look how many weeds are there. Uh, when you're using plastic mulch rows, must you replace mulch after every planting? Uh, plastic mulch usually lasts about a year. Uh, I've had success uh, growing two crops in it, uh, spring, and then I follow in the same planting hole uh, with a fall crop. Of course, you, you want to make sure it doesn't rip or dogs don't walk on it or uh, anything like this. But then uh, at the end, it does not last more than a, than a year. But yes, uh, so it, uh, it is more for commercial growers. Uh, for homeowners, how about you use cardboard? I think cardboard is an untapped resource that we don't use often. Even if you have a raised bed, why don't you use cardboard and throw the mulch on top of it? Cardboard is a better insulator. Instead of having to put six inches of mulch to be effective to control your weeds and to lose less water, mulch, uh, cardboard, and one inch of um, uh, mulch, if you don't like the look of cardboard and you want to decorate it with a thin layer of mulch, cardboard is an insulator. It's definitely a better uh, weed control barrier. 
um, and it breaks down and um, uh, it's it's organic and even the paint or the color paint that's on those cardboard boxes is soybean type oils so that is safe it's not toxic to the soil or anything like this so here uh, let me go back to the solarization so this is 83 days later you'll see only a few perennial weeds that uh, survived and this was taken a couple of days ago uh, show, uh, 210 days later and of course the, the plastic was removed uh, since uh, since uh, November 5th I did not put the plastic back on so here is the residual effect uh, about a hundred days later hundred you know 120 days later three months three four months later a residual effect of the solarization non-solarized uh, a jungle of weed a jungle of insects uh, all kind of diseases and here uh, only a few I mean this is one whole plant but uh, only a few plants and all of these are perennials uh, not no annual weeds uh, yes it's not good the acid uh, weeds have to be done but look uh, compared to if you have not solarized at all uh, where you are so solarization does work you add compost uh, uh, you re you rejuvenate the soil and uh, you're fine now uh, biological practices um, some work some don't work uh, there's uh, there are lots of uh, resistant varieties for example tomatoes if you are into hybrids uh, um, there are lots of nematode uh, resistant, uh, fusarium resistant, mosaic virus resistant varieties. Uh, um, another idea is marigolds for nematode control. Uh, I, I, it, it, it does work, but in theory you need a lot of marigolds to act as a barrier for nematodes to move into a new area. Uh, and they get really big they take valuable space on the raised bed so I'd rather you use uh, you know solarization or uh, or organic products uh, that, that are nematicide they kill nematodes and here's example of a couple of names and I'll go over uh, syncosin a little bit later in detail uh, but those are organic nematicides basically they are derived from plant extracts uh, they uh, they reduce the feeding I guess they give them stomach ache to the bad nematodes root knot nematodes they don't eat, feed as fast but it does not affect the good nematodes or the earthworms in, the, in your soil uh, so by competition the good nematodes uh, will grow faster and keep the bad nematodes in check uh, because they're not eating as fast okay so um, for a lot of homeowners I think solarization is still your best option but syncosin is an option that you may want to consider as uh, for organic product to control your nematodes after planting practices back to sanitation uh, a uh, just like before planting practices you gotta remove all the plants and plant parts okay this is the time to check the plant, uh, roots of your tomatoes and see if they have nematodes uh, or uh, some other soil uh, rot that you need to worry about. Why do not use tobacco? Because tobacco, uh, for example, if you smoke, the tobacco mosaic virus can survive the burning flame and blow in the air and then infect your tomatoes. In, uh, in greenhouse tomato production, uh, you're not even allowed to chew tobacco if you work inside there because of the possibility of spreading uh, the tobacco mosaic virus so sanitation is paramount clean your equipment um, uh, the best gardeners I know uh, and I learned that from him he had a bucket a five gallon bucket with sand in it uh, and uh, sand is like an abrasive to clean the tool and uh, he is oils it it, uh, the hole at the end when it's done and uh, pushes it in the sand a few times to scrub off uh, any things that you don't see before he hangs it back in the tool shed.
Uh, a good idea for sanitation if you're suckering your tomatoes, if you're weeding, if you're uh, harvesting, if you're cutting excess branches. Do it when the plants are dry. Do not do it when they uh, mo uh, moist uh, or do on them because the moisture uh, will spread the, the spores of the diseases from one plant to another. Okay, and when you're working in the soil, cultivating, hoeing, whatever you're trying to do, don't spread dirt on the plants. And really, you don't have to worry about this statement, avoid dirtying plants during cultivation. If you use mulch, if you use cardboard, if you use any kind of barrier, you'll never have to see the dirt again. Some of the best gardens, and I tell people uh, this to everybody, some of the best gardens is where you see plants or mulch. You don't see bare ground. Those are some of the best raised beds. And I'm going to give you examples here. I'm not going to go over every one. We won't have enough time today. Uh, but these are references for you. The name of the product. Uh, the name of the product, for example, agriphage. What does it control? And the labeled product. And the labeled crops for, for that product. For example, if you have soil-borne plant diseases, Root shield is an option. It can, uh, it's, can be used on eggplant, pepper, tomato, leafy vegetable, cold crops. Also, GH. GH stands for greenhouse. If you grow plants in a greenhouse or in a high tunnel, uh, it, uh, not everything uh, can be used inside. But in this example, root shield, microstop for seed rot, stem rot can be used in a greenhouse. Some of you may be familiar with Serenade. Serenade is, uh, is very popular for control of mildews, uh, early blight, fire blight, bacterial uh, diseases, and it's labeled on any vegetable. So this is a reference uh, information. And I send out a handout uh, as an attachment. I hope you have it uh, about some additional uh, products labeled for the homeowner. Uh, here's more actinovate, and again, here's the diseases it controls and the labeled crop. Any vegetable also in the greenhouse. Soil guard, if you have soil diseases, pythium, which can be a serious disease, this is one of them, one of those diseases that you may not want to uh, add back into the compost pile. Whereas these here are not an issue to put back in the compost pile, the powder mildew alternaria, because they are just there and everywhere and uh, um, not serious issue. Oxidate. Uh, oxidate is like, uh, for those of you who remember uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide, you cut yourself, you add it, uh, and it, you see all kind of bubbles coming up. Well, that's exactly what oxidate is. It's all of these are organic products. This one you can spray and uh, a minute later eat uh, the fruit or the leaves. It's that safe. Uh, Bordeaux mixture is a uh, time-tested old, old, old product, and I don't see why most of us, uh, what why most of us do not make our own Bordeaux mixture. Uh, basically, it's a mixture of uh, copper sulfate, lime, and water. And here is the cookbook recipe. Uh, don't try to make a lot and let it sit to make, let's say, one gallon, two gallons at a time, and then spray it. It's a wonderful product. Controls most. Uh, fungal, bacterial diseases, leaf spots on vegetables, on grapes. That's what it was uh, uh, made first in Bordeaux, uh, France, uh, and they were used on vines. So you can use it on trees, on vines, on vegetables, you make your own. It's a wonderful product uh, um, and all organic. Uh, 